right. Um, hello. Uh, so welcome to everybody who's joined uh, today uh, for this year's webinar on the NERC Panorama DTP. Uh, my name is Rob Terrell, um, and I'm the whole lead uh, for the for the doctoral training program uh, here at Hull. Um, we're recording the webinar uh, today, uh, just so everyone's aware, um, and we will email um, everybody a link uh, afterwards uh, so you can review anything you didn't catch um, the, the first time around. Um, now I want to start off um, and uh, say a few words about the Panorama uh, <coughs> program itself. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Right. Uh, so the Panorama is a cross-university doctoral training programme uh, set up in 2019, uh, led by the Universities of Leeds with Hull and York. Um, its goal really is to train uh, future research leaders uh, and advance uh, natural environmental uh, science. Um, at the University of Hull, students from Panorama DTP are placed within the Energy Environment Institute established in 2017, um, the EEI is a cross-faculty centre um, promoting transdisciplinary research uh, to tackle the twin goals of global environmental resilience uh, and energy sustainability. Coming up, um, we're going to have a series of short talks from academics describing their proposals for PhD projects uh, here at Hull. Um, and then there's going to be a questions and answers with supervisors and some of the current um, whole DTP students um, at the end. Um, if you have any questions at any time, please post them into the chat. Um, if we don't get through all of your questions, uh, we will respond to them uh, via email um, after the webinar. Um, but to start off with, there is a video. The NERC Panorama DTP offers postgraduate students the ability to make connections with other universities much more easily than it would normally be. I personally really like working at the University of Hull because it's a very positive environment and I especially like that people really think in opportunities and are always enthusiastic to listen to my ideas. At Hull we have a whole host of experience from both academic and industry partners as well as access to high resolution survey grade equipment such as drones, the terrestrial laser scanner as well as the total environment simulator. The candidates from all three universities meet regularly over virtual platforms to discuss progress or just to be social. Being within the Energy and Environment Institute has also been really great. Uh, being constantly surrounded by so many postgraduate researchers and lecturers with such a broad knowledge base and a wide variety of fields. I look forward to completing my PhD and to having a career within the research industry and helping towards a more sustainable future. Through the DTP at Hull, I have taken advantage of the partnership between Leeds, York and Hull Universities by incorporating academic supervisors from multiple universities to guide me through my PhD. I have two supervisors from Hull and one from Leeds. This not only allows me to benefit from the support of one university, but two. This opens the possibilities to grow my academic reach and build my peer group as I undertake my PhD. When I first came to view the campus, I fell in love with it, the whole vibe of it. I really enjoy being a researcher because I get to work on the topics that interest me the most and um, challenge myself in developing new skills and overcoming new challenges nearly every day. I really enjoy Hull and I don't think I'll ever move back down south. Here at Hull there's a lot of research on natural systems and challenges such as climate change and flood risk and I'm excited to contribute to these studies with my more fundamental approach. Being placed at the Energy and Environment Institute gives me a chance to work with world-renowned experts in sediment transport, flooding, uh, microplastics, wind energy. Also giving a chance to work in a very international and multicultural environment. Just think about all those international dinner parties. Being placed in Hull also gives uh, a great chance to explore the nature around. I myself really love hiking and there are some wonderful hiking paths around. The marine setting gives a sort of tranquility, but there is a 
quite extensive nightlife in hell as well, so I think it would suit all the tastes. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so moving on, uh, we're now going to have a series of short talks from all of the academics uh, describing their research proposals. Uh, we'll start off um, with Andy Nunn. Now, unfortunately, Andy couldn't be here today, uh, so he's asked me to give a very brief overview of his project uh, on, uh, on his behalf. Um, and his project is, is looking at assessing the impacts of floodplain uh, rehabilitation on fish populations. Um, this is uh, some really, really exciting research um, developed out of the University of Hull um, using some novel uh, bio uh, telemetry um, uh, techniques uh, developed here uh, to understand how um, natural uh, and artificial um, water bodies uh, can impact um, uh, fish populations uh, in uh, rivers uh, across the UK. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Now, as I said, um, Andy and his team couldn't be here today, but they did ask that if anybody does have any questions uh, for them uh, regarding this PhD project for, for you to uh, reach out and ask them directly. Um, so I'll just leave it here uh, with their names um, and you can uh, get in touch with them via our website. So I'll hand over next uh, to Professor Rob Nell. Okay, thank you. Um, I have to start by saying that I have to run away straight after I finish this um, because I'm taking my daughter for an evening of Finnish heavy metal at a Nightwish gig at uh, Wembley. Um, so if you've got any questions, um, maybe uh, either ask straight after this or email me. Um, so my name's Rob Nell. Um, what I work on is the those aspects of organisms biology that can affect their long term population resilience and ability to adapt to changing environments. Um, we've got some tantalizing evidence um, from some recent work that two things that you wouldn't necessarily think of uh, that might affect these uh, could actually be quite important. And these are polyandry. So how many times a female is likely to mate and also the size of an organism's genome. Um, so there's interesting data coming out of the plant literature to indicate that genome size can be very important. Um, no one's really looked at this with animal literature. Um, what we want to do is look at this with two fantastic long-term data sets um, on the British, British moths, um, the, the Rothamsted Insect Survey data set and the National Moth Recording Scheme data set. Um, these give us 50 years worth of data for about 500 species of moths. Um, and so we want to look at the influence of polyandry and genome size on persistence and uh, population change in these species. Um, so for the studentship, um, we've been measuring polyandry and genome size and then relating those relating those metrics back to back to the existing data that we have on um, on moth population dynamics over the last 50 years. Um, can we have the next slide, please? And we've got a fantastic um, supervision team for this. Um, that's me with the beetle. Um, beetles with big horns make me happy. So me and James Gilbert from Hull, uh, both ecological entomologists. Then we've got Andrew Leach from Queen Mary, uh, who's the big expert on genome size and ecology. And finally, Richard Fox from Butterfly Conservation, who's worked previously with these very large data sets and, um, and has published a lot of stuff using these data sets. So he's, he's an expert on using these available data sets. Okay, that's my two minutes, so I'd better stop. Hello everyone, um, so I'm Charlie, I'm going to be introducing our project investigating sediment transport processes on, on our sloped beds. Um, so this project is really motivated by the large scale fluvial systems that, that exist on our Earth's surface, such as mountain streams, rivers and, and estuaries. Um, and these are a key control on how uh, sediment, nutrients and pollutants are, are transported across the Earth's surface. Um, and predictions of morphology are critical to understanding these systems, but they there's currently a big limitation um, of our current models, which are highly dependent on, um, on on small scale transport processes, which are really quite poorly understood. 
Um, so here I've got um, a diagram of, or, or a little picture of um, one of these uh, models. And you can see that um, the original Dell 3D model, which is a piece of software that you often use to model these types of systems, um, gives very different predictions to the kind of river systems that you see in, in real life when you compare it to the river system in that picture um, above. Um, and it's only with some quite large model calibrations that you actually get something realistic. But the problem is that these calibrations are strongly dependent on small scale sediment transport processes that are really quite poorly understood. And it's difficult to justify these kind of calibration choices. So what this project will be doing is looking at these fundamental transport dynamics at a very small scale, um, using some really novel uh, experimental and numerical um, uh, pieces of kit um, to try and kind of better justify how we're calibrating these large scale models. Can we move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so I've, we've, we've included a little picture of our new um, measurement equipment at the bottom left. So this is um, this, is a, this, this new piece of measurement equipment is going to be able to measure not only the fluid velocities in, in three in four dimensions, but also particle velocities and and certain, and uh, the density of the, of the water as well. And with this huge data set, we're going to be able to fully understand how, how these sediment transport processes are occurring on these slope beds and hopefully build up um, model parameterizations that can then inform these, these larger scale models. Um, if you have any questions and don't hesitate to contact the supervisory team, so that's Anne Barr, uh, me and uh, Dr. Rob Durrell as well. So, thank you. Hi, good evening everybody. Um, my name is Becky Williams and I'm a volcanologist. Next slide. So I'm the PI of the Catastrophic Flows Research Cluster. Um, we're a group of people with a particular interest in hazardous volcanic flows. And the PhD that we're offering as part of Panorama is Can You Stop a PDC? So PDCs or pyroclastic density currents are um, flows that come out of volcanoes in some of the most explosive and hazardous eruptions. As you can see here in the bottom left is a picture of Mount Sinabung. They're currents of um, rock and ash and gas, and they can travel up to 500 miles an hour and be up to 1,000 degrees C. So they're incredibly hazardous, but there's a lot about their fundamental behaviours that we don't let understand. And so our group takes an integrated approach to understanding them using analogue models. As you can see here in the middle picture, some pictures of our flume experiments, and integrating this with field work. And in particular, um, what we don't understand about these currents is their interaction with topography. And this project is will be looking at how these flows interact with topography and how that results in their sedimentation behaviours. We're looking at this from a hazard assessment perspective. Topographic barriers are often used around volcanic slopes to delineate safe zones. And um, for example, if you've got large hills, um, people on living on the other side of those hills are often considered safe from these um, hazardous events. But recent work by myself, one of the supervisory team, Natasha Dowie, has revealed actually quite unusual and interesting behaviours of these currents around different types of topography. And so what we're really trying to do with this project is understand those behaviours. Um, so the student will be using modelling in our flume lab, both at Sheffield Hallam and the University of Bristol, to first find out some fundamental behaviours um, of these um, currents and then using field work to really ground truth and benchmark what we're finding in the lab to try and assess um, how the volcanic flows may be behaving both on natural topography but also looking at this from a built environment approach so really trying to take an applied um, look at these currents. Next slide please. So the team we have um, to supervise this project um, is myself, I'm a physical volcanologist with expertise in volcanic successions and particularly pyroclastic density currents from a field work and a modelling approach. Um, Pete Rowley um, and Natasha Dowie are both in that picture at the top. Um, you can see building actually our most recent um, flume facility. Um, Pete has expertise in physical volcanology, but particular in the analogue modelling and experimental approaches. 
Uh, Natasha is a physical volcanologist with expertise in sedimentology in particular and how to quantify the types of uncertainty that we see within volcanic successions and our interpretation of those. And finally, um, we're collaborating with Rob Thomas on this project, who has expertise in analog, analog modeling, but comes at this project from a, an applied geomorphology um, approach. And so he's bringing his expertise developed on flood risk to this particular project. Thank you very much. Hello, um, I'm Domino Joyce. I'm a senior lecturer in evolutionary biology and I'm interested in how species evolve. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this project uh, that I'm offering is designed to test the idea that magic traits can accelerate evolution. So magic traits are interesting because theoretically at least, they're bits of the genome that can have um, two functions. So they can be responsible for helping an organism adapt ecologically, but they can also be responsible at the same time for affecting mate choice. So that means that if you've got a population that has at this particular region of the genome is diverging in two different ways and you're getting different ecological adaptations, then at the same time you can have that being reinforced by mate choice because the same gene is responsible for both things. And because you've got um, reproductive isolation, you get the population splitting into two species much more quickly than it would in normal kind of evolutionary time frames. So we think that's why they're called magic traits. We think that they, they do kind of magic things to populations. Um, so we want to test this and we can test this uh, experimentally, which is really like novel and exciting. And we can do it using cichlid fish because they're mouth brooders, so we can get hold of their eggs relatively easily and we can use CRISPR genetic um, technology to genetically modify the fish. So in this project, what we propose doing is um, genetically modifying fish to test the magic trait idea. And we think that vision genes are a good place to start in this because there's lots of um, uh, evidence already that they're ecologically important because the, the, the uh, environment is different at different depths. And we also know that they're involved in mate choice because they're involved in females seeing different male nuptial colours and they find different nuptial colours attractive. So vision genes are a really good way of testing this. So we've got pre-planned vision genes and we're going to genetically manipulate and we then test to see what um, effect that has on the fish's behaviour, both ecologically and from a mate choice point of view. Um, but we've also got um, a transcriptomic data set based on deep water fish like these. Uh, and so we've got the transcriptomes from the eyes of these uh, deep water adapted fish. So you can have a look bioinformatically to see if there's any other genes that you want to um, test um, in the same way. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this is primarily supervised by me and Amelia Santos at Cambridge, who's developed the CRISPR technology in these fish. Um, we've got absolutely amazing aquarium facilities. And the idea with this project is that you end up doing a mixture of CRISPR, um, some bioinformatics, some transcriptomics, some animal behavior. And there's plenty of scope to develop your own ideas at the end of the project um, so that you can kind of uh, choose whichever thing you like best and develop that even more. Thanks. Hello, my name is Pete Watson um, and I'm from the School of Engineering. Um, the next slide please. Um, despite um, being an engineer, I have an interest in uh, functional morphology and the role that environment can play on the morphology, uh, particularly uh, of the skull of animals. Um, and I have a research interest in using some engineering techniques which can be able to predict how things like the bone in the skull can react to differences in environments such as changes in diet. So that's kind of feeds into the idea of this PhD, which is looking at the, um, the computational biomechanics in scrolls. So at the moment there is um, a very topical, um, it's a very topical um, uh, at the moment where I, whereby there is a declining population of red scrolls and that's correlated to an increase in the population of grey scrolls in the UK. Uh, myself and one of the um, supervisory team, we currently have a project where we're trying to look and study the biomechanics of red and grey scrolls 
and identify whether one is uh, adapted more to feeding on a wider range uh, of foods and whether that makes them uh, more advantageous uh, in terms of survival than the other. So this 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 PhD idea is kind of a spin-off of that where we're proposing to actually look at the material properties uh, of, the, of the bones in red and square schools to identify whether there is a variation in there. And then we can use our computational software such as fire helmet analysis, which you can see there's a, 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 a colorful image uh, of a, a, a squirrel skull there. Um, and that helps us identify how the um, skull will behave to variations in material properties that may have been caused due to alterations in diet and that will help us identify uh, whether uh, one particular uh, species of the squirrels uh, is uh, more capable of sustaining on a wider food diet compared to the other. Uh, on the next slide please. Thank you. Um, this is the supervisory team. So there's, there's myself, um, and we've also got Professor Jaiwe and me who will also be supervising at the School of Engineering here at Hull as well, who has expertise in, in, in um, material testing. But then we've also got shown there um, Phil Cox uh, from UCL, who has got a, a large interest in the mammalian skill uh, and functional morphology, particularly of the rodents. And then we've also got uh, Dr. Andrew Kitchener as well, who is from um, the National Museums in Scotland, who also has a, other expertise in functional morphology um, on a wide range uh, of, of um, anatomical um, locations, but also of the school as well. So with the uh, supervisory team we've got there, we kind of got a nice complement of those that are doing computational modeling and those with more of the functional morphology and anatomical knowledge. Okay, thank you. There's always one, isn't there? Hi, um, I'm Kath Waller uh, and I'm a lecturer in environmental marine biology in the School of um, Environmental Sciences, Sciences. So I'm sort of interested in how the environment affects community structure and how species move around. Um, I work a lot uh, in Antarctica and the Arctic. So this, this project uh, is a follow-up to some work we've done previously where we found a piece of non-native kelp on Deception Island in Antarctica. Now, Deception is interesting because it's volcanic, so the environmental conditions are not the same as the rest of Antarctica. But we found this piece of non-native kelp with a, a non-native and invasive bryozoan on it. Now, it's not invasive until it sort of uh, spreads, but it started us thinking, could kelp be a big vector for getting new species into the Antarctic, particularly from places like the Falkland Islands, um, which are quite close to the, the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, so this is a, a project where uh, we are working with people in the Falklands to, to try and determine what the physiological capabilities of these species that live on the kelp are. Do they jump off if, you, if the kelp gets ripped off by storms? So there's loads and loads of stuff that we're doing there. It's been estimated there's something like 70 million kelp rafts uh, in the Southern Ocean at any one time. And these are not like little kelp raft, rafts that you get in the UK. These things could be the size of you know, football pitches. The kelp down there is enormous. And they do carry a variety of these hitchhiking animals. So what we're trying to do is, is find out if things from the Falkland Islands could have the physiological capacity, bearing in mind the peninsula is warming really, really quickly, to, to float across and then inhabit. So there's a lot of thinking about um, the species reproduction and uh, how long the kelp's going to be afloat and all, all this sort of thing. So we have a lot of ideas which are in the project description that we'd like you to do, but we're very flexible. As Domino said, you can take this project and, you know, run with run with some of your ideas as well. Can I have the next slide, please? So we've got um, two University of Hull supervisors, myself and Dr. Roddy Foster. Rodney works on kelp in the UK. He also does a lot of remote sensing. Uh, he does a lot with kelp growth and primary productivity. I'm sort of a, an Antarctic um, environmental scientist, if you like. It's running collaboration with the British Antarctic Survey. So that is Dr. Hugh Griffiths, who's a biogeographer uh, and, and a marine ecologist. 
and we also have a case partner down in the Falklands which is the South Atlantic Environmental Research Institute so there will be a field campaign in the Falklands sort of going out and collecting the kelp so diving is a really good thing if you've got it uh, and there are labs down there so you would be expected to spend some time in the Falkland Islands as well. Thank you. Okay, so um, my name is uh, uh, Graham Ferrier. I'm based in the uh, School of Environmental Sciences. Um, so this project is based on looking at uh, carbon storage in natural and abandoned um, oil and uh, gas sedimentary basins because they offer a, a significant opportunity for reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide. But there's an urgent need to develop many more sites for large scale carbon storage operations. However, the scale of the basins and the complexity of the lithological and structural analysis required to fully characterize the carbon storage uh, capacity and containment capabilities using current um, field and laboratory based methods is extremely expensive and time consuming. So what this project is aiming to do is to demonstrate the potential of a, a whole new uh, suite of ground and particularly UAV mounted hyperspectral and LIDAR imaging sensors and platforms. And the aim of this is to be able to remotely identify the key sedimentary lithologies and properties and also structures accurately at a range of scales from both site up to basin and this will help us assess uh, the capacity of these sedimentary basins for both carbon storage and containment. Uh, could you get the next slide, please? So uh, I'm the principal investigator on this project, but we've got a, a multi-host uh, um, team. So uh, Richard Collier, who is um, head of the basin analysis team in the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences in Leeds, um, has an expertise on sedimentary processes. Eddie Dempsey in Hull uh, has an expertise in structural geology applied to hydrocarbon and geothermal basin analysis. And this project um, is a case project, which means that we have an industrial partner. And um, our industrial partner is K CASP, which is a, a spin off uh, University of Cambridge company, which is a world leader in all aspects of clastic sedimentology, uh, basin analysis. And uh, a key aspect of this project will be the close involvement of CASP in, in the training uh, and the uh, support of the analysis um, of the results of the remote sensing um, data sets. Okay, thank you very much. Hello and good evening. Uh, my name is Arvid Schwendel. I'm at the Oxford John University, but here you can see that we've got quite a wide um, supervisory team for this project, um, including geomorphologists, river scientists, um, experts in remote sensing, geochemistry, and the remediation of um, mine sediments. Next slide, please. So the title of this project is the mobilization of metal mining waste in rivers in a changing climatological regime. The idea is that we have got some evidence that the um, magnitude and frequency of floods in the British uplands is increasing. And um, where this happens can be quite catastrophic, it can be mobilizing the entire valley floor and all the sediments that are stored there. And that includes sediments that are as a result of historic mining activities. So for example, waste heaps or tailings, and um, as well as sediments that store, um, that are, has been just deposited re, um, previously as a result of um, point discharges from mining waste into the floodplain. So the aim of the project is to uh, provide an inventory of source of cont contamination of floodplains um, and rivers in, in these um, catchments, so that requires some remote sensing work, some um, looking at existing archives and databases. 
Secondly, um, we'd like to um, assess the sensitivity of these catchments uh, to, in terms of their geomorphic response to such, uh, uh, to such floods, um, particularly looking at um, future climate change scenarios, because in all these climate change scenarios, uh, flooding in terms of frequency and uh, magnitude will become more severe, whichever model you look at. So we need to know, know what the response of these catchments to um, these um, changing climatic conditions. And finally, we'd like to know what happens with the sediments. So um, there will be a field uh, work uh, part of this module of, of this, of this um, project where we're going to um, assess the sediments in the field, but also with remote sensing, um, looking at connectivity um, to the um, predicted river heights and, and um, using modeling, numerical modeling, in order to assess what happens with the sediments. Next slide, please. So in terms of the methodology involved, uh, I mentioned um, remote sensing will be a key um, part, uh, including the analysis in, in um, GIS, um, field work, mapping connectivities, and um, using remote sensing techniques to, to um, assess this. And finally, there's a strong component of numerical modeling. We've got um, partners in local river trusts and the environment agency that's very interested in this project and have their own interests, and so we can work with them to assess um, zones of sediment storage, uh, transport pathways, um, hydrochemical um, exchanges between um, sediment and the water column, uh, which um, transports these contaminants further downstream. Thank you. Right, firstly, I'd like to, um, to thank all of um, all of the colleagues uh, today who've um, presented uh, their different proposals uh, for all the uh, fantastic different PhD projects um, that we've we've seen. Um, next, uh, we've got an opportunity for a, for a questions and answers session with all of the supervisors, um, also um, with one of the current students from uh, the NERC uh, Panorama DTP here at Hull. Ed, who's who's kindly agreed to join us um, tonight, um, and myself and Joe from the Energy Environment Institute. Um, so, if I could ask all of the um, uh, the, the supervisors to turn their cameras on um, and, and join us back, and now we'll go straight to questions. Um, and I see we've got an immediate question uh, for Becky. Um, Becky. Is there, there's a question here asking, could you share or suggest um, any uh, references, any literature uh, for your project on PDCs? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and without wanting to bore everybody by listing a bunch of references right here on the webinar, if the student wants to drop me an email, I can send them direct links um, to the particular references that would be useful to them. Um, but looking up the work of me, uh, Natasha Dowie, or Pete Rowley um, would be the, a good first port of call. Or our recently graduated PhD student, Greg Smith, um, has got a couple of publications that will give you an insight of the kind of work that we're doing within the research cluster. Okay, thank you very much, Becky. Um, right, next question coming in. Um, are international students also receiving full funding? Joe, Joe Dewey, can I hand over to you here? International students receiving full funding? Hi there, yes. Um, it, it, the um, Panorama DTP is open to international students, so um, we're able to offer up to 30% full scholarships to international candidates. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it's an opportunity for international students but 30% of the cohort. So I believe this year there's 24 studentship awards available across the DTP. Um, so 30% of that is, is seven, I believe. So, so yeah, there are certainly funding for international students and that's full funding for fees and stipend. Right, okay, thanks Joe. And I think there's probably gonna be a couple more questions for you here. Um, can you confirm the application deadline, please? I believe it's the 4th of January, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. The application deadline is Wednesday, the 4th of January, and obviously applications are open now. Um, if I can encourage people who are applying to please um, read the this on the Panorama website. We can put the um, links in the chat. I think uh, Maria or Amy can put the links in the 
the chat so that people can see the links but on the panorama website there's a how to apply and an faq section which i think would be really useful for people to read um, as they're doing their application there's a few sort of useful bits of information in there so yeah deadline wednesday the 4th of january and that will detail um, along with all of the the individual projects will detail the different qualifications needed um, absolutely yeah Okay. Yeah, there's all sorts of information in there, so um, it's a really useful thing to read as you're putting your application together. And of course, you can get in touch with the supervisors if you want to discuss the project a little bit more as well. That's sometimes a useful thing to do, isn't it, as you're putting your application together. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Next question. Another question for Becky. Um, what are the key skills and knowledge an ideal candidate should have prior to applying? Uh, for your project and what training would the successful candidate receive, Becky? Hi, um, we're looking for candidates with a wide range of backgrounds. If you have done um, physical, physical um, geography or if you've done geology or earth science, um, then you'll be more than suited um, for this kind of project. But also if you're coming from more of an engineering background as well, this kind of um, project would suit you because of the, its applied nature. Um, in terms of skills, the project would involve some lab work, um, so attention to detail, diligence, um, respect for lab protocols um, are going to be some of the most important things. Um, and then just a, I guess, a, an approach to um, detailed rigorous methodology and a real just capacity and desire to, to study volcanology. So we'll give you all the training. So we'll train you in, in using the laboratory facilities. We'll train you in the field work. We don't expect you to have studied volcanology um, or have done volcanology field work before. And we will do all of that with you once you join us. Okay, thanks, Becky. And there's a similar question here from uh, uh, on on, uh, on a more generic um, uh, point. Um, saying uh, when choosing a student for a PhD programme, are there any specific things you are looking for on applications, for example, work experience, lab experience, volunteering, what makes the applicant stand out? Um, so I'd say in, in answer to that, um, a large part of it does depend on the specific um, PhD uh, project that you're applying for. Um, there, there will obviously be certain skills, as, um, as Becky just uh, talked to, that are, are relevant for, for different types of projects. So I'd encourage um, any anybody who's interested in any of the uh, projects uh, discussed tonight to reach out and discuss them directly um, with uh, the with the supervisors themselves. Right. Um, what kind of accommodation is available for postgrad students? Joe, can I hand over to you again on this one? Hi there. Sorry, um, I was just looking at um, application uh, information on the on the website to see if there's anything else to add on that one. So, in terms of accommodation, um, great range of, great range of application. Or, accommodation options for you to pick from at Hull um, so probably you can you can live on campus um, there's sort of easy access, access to lectures the gym students union etc or there's also accommodation off campus um, again there's a link that we can share um, I think Maria and Amy can add that link in um, which will take you through to look at the accommodation area of the website you'll be able to look at pictures and have a search and look at all the information so we'll share that link with you um, with regard to the accommodation at Hull. Ed, Ed Gilbert, would you be able to say anything about accommodation at Hull, what it's like to live um, here in, in Hull, how you find it? Yeah, um, Hull's great, I like it here. Um, in terms of accommodation, I mean Personally, I'm just in a private accommodation, which is a professional house share with a few other people who are just working individuals. Um, so I think it's important to sort of consider all options and what's important to you, whether you want personal space or close to campus or those sort of things. Okay, thanks very much, Ed. Right, next question. Um, 
can somebody apply for more than one project at a time? No, I'm, I'm really sorry. People can only apply for one uh, NERC DTP uh, PhD project at a time. So next questions, any more questions? Right. There, there, just, sorry, there is, but I, I can't type it in, so I'll, I'll read it out. Um, for Dr. Williams, in regard to the field work, do you already have particular research areas to study the PDC? Hi, um, so we have some favourite field areas, um, but this project is really about understanding pyroclastic density currents and their processes. So what we do is we go to the best exposures to study what it is that we're looking for. Um, so we don't tend to go back to the same area to try and understand, for example, a volcanic succession of a particular volcano. What we do is we'll do, once we start getting into the lab experiments and we start trying to really tie down the particular aspects that we're trying to benchmark with the natural deposits, we will then decide um, the best locality. Um, so areas that we've been to um, before for this kind of work here are Tenerife and um, the exposures there are brilliant because it's a desert they're really well exposed in the Barrancos it's one of a world-class place to study ignimbrites and PDCs but we've also looked at the um, ignimbrites around Naples um, and Santorini um, and I did a lot of my own work on on Pantelleria so these are all potential places um, that in the first year of the project the student will help and uh, will be the person who's kind of identifying and choosing the best field places um, to look at for this project. Right. Um, Becky, there's another question for you, I'm afraid. Um, since the experimental uh, setups are in Bristol and Sheffield, roughly how much time would be spent across Hull, Sheffield and Bristol, as I already live in Bristol? So you'll be based at home um, for most of your time. We tend to do the, the lab experiments in week or two blocks. Um, so you'll go down to whichever lab it is that is best suited um, for your particular work and do a week or two of experiments um, every few months. Um, but most, the lab experiments actually, you collect a huge amount of data in a relatively short time. Um, the longer piece of work is in the, the analysis and the understanding. Um, which you'll be doing at home. But we have um, open access to those labs um, because the collaborators are on the projects and they're kind of joint owned by all of us. Um, so there's no problem in having to return um, if you need to throughout the course of your project. Okay, there's another question here on international students and international um, fees. Um, so does the University of Hull um, waive um, international fees uh, for international students? Um, the answer to that question is yes, it does, but international applicants do need to have proof of English language available, um, uh, for example, uh, relevant level IELTS or uh, TOEFL test certificates. Right, so I think we've reached the end of the questions. Is there any last questions anybody would like to ask? Right, well, look, I'd like to thank everybody for coming along uh, today. It's been uh, it's been really great uh, to host you all and to hear all of the fantastic research presentations um, from our colleagues here at Hull. Uh, I hope you uh, consider applying to the NERC DTP um, to one of these uh, fantastic uh, projects and, and hopefully we will see you here at Hull soon.